Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brand Storytelling live stream for April 29th, 2020. I'm Rick Parkhill, and I'm glad you're with us today. The live streams air every Wednesday at this time. Our goal is to deliver timely, relevant topics and discussions with brand storytellers and their partners. These shows are for you, so please let us know how we're doing and how we can best serve your needs with future topics and guests. Just email me, I'm Rick at brandstorytelling.tv, that's .tv. Just drop me a note. Uh, today we have a power panel of journalists whose career path has led them to become brand storytellers. I'm delighted to introduce Heidi Collins today to host this discussion. Now, you'll know Heidi from her years at CNN where she was the anchor and host of CNN Newsroom with Heidi Collins, which was the number two highest rated show across all day parts and primetime programming. The live two-hour show covered national, international breaking news, business, and politics. This woman has interviewed heads of state and a sitting American president. She earned her way to the top of the TV news world and then left it to become a brand storyteller. You're gonna love meeting Heidi and her guests today as they share their stories and take your questions. Heidi, the screen is all yours. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, thank you, Rick. Really appreciate it. And I'm so excited to uh, have the discussion today and certainly am joined by three terrific uh, former journalists, although I think our DNA would say once a journalist, always a journalist, probably. Um, so I'm going to quickly go ahead and introduce who's with us today. First off, I want to introduce Robin Benefield. You can go ahead and wave if you want to, Robin. She joins us from Marriott International and is the Editorial Director at Creative and Content Marketing. Thank you, Robin, for being with us. Also, we have Megan Wells of Two Birds Films. She's a director, filmmaker, content creator, has worked with a variety of really cool brands doing really, really beautiful work. And finally, Angela Matusik of HP, and Angela is the head of corporate brand content and creative. So once again, thank you for joining me. And I look forward to having an awesome discussion. Uh, what we're going to do first, everybody, is kind of do a little bit of a round robin. And we're going to tell our story of, as Rick mentioned, uh, being journalists in, in whatever vein that journalism was, uh, to becoming corporate brand storytellers. And uh, we will go around and share those stories for you quickly. Then we'll get into our topics and we'll talk a little bit more about the state of brand journalism right now and, um, and many other things. Couple quick housekeeping notes before we get going. Our good friend Robin here, uh, thankfully, has been um, on furlough with Marriott and is now headed back to work today. So we give her a quick round of applause and we take that as inspiration that things are getting better and healthier as we move forward in the business world through COVID-19. So great news on that, Robin. Um, what that means is that she has to leave us at 3.30. So I would just encourage everyone who has questions that might be specific to Robin or for the Marriott work uh, to make sure that they get those out there before we have to say goodbye at 3.30 Central. Sorry, I realize we're national. So in about 30 minutes, we're gonna lose Robin. Um, in any event, we will move to our topics after we do this quick round Robin and hear everybody's story. I'll go ahead and kick off quickly. And again, uh, like we talked about before the show, um, it's hard to take your journey and kind of cut it down to 60 seconds. I actually practiced a few times and failed rapidly. So bear with me. I'll tell you just a little bit about uh, how it all came to be for me. Um, I'd always wanted to be a journalist and started by um, setting up my stuffed animals when I was nine years old and broadcasting to this wonderful um, audience, I guess you could call them, that never really complained about anything that I said or anything that I wore. They were some of my greatest audiences <laughs> to date. Um, and I sort of came up with this idea that, wow, I, I'm, I'm taking facts and I'm relaying them to people and to the audience. And from nine years old, that carried on all the way through journalism school, at the University of Maryland, go Terps. Um, finished with a degree in advertising, actually. 
So I went on to graduate school and um, auditioned during graduate school for a live news show that they had broadcast every single day from a PBS, T uh, PBS CNN affiliate. Auditioned for the news, cut off five inches of my hair and cried for two years listening to my Minnie Mouse type high pitched voice that I thought no way anyone would ever want to listen to. Thankfully made it through that and landed my first job in TV news, market 139. Um, moved my way up over many, many years and uh, worked for affiliates at NBC and CBS and then um, landed at CNN. Spent about eight years there. And um, wow, I mean, that was, that was really an experience. Learned so much about news and storytelling and, um, and the power of it, really. From there, um, went back to local Fox News in my hometown. I was offered a, a really interesting main anchor position and did that contract. And pretty much halfway through, started really thinking about how much I was very interested in business and what was being done uh, specifically in this new brand journalism, brand storytelling space. So uh, left news at that point, did some uh, chief communications officer work for a small firm in New York, did some executive counsel for a while, and then went to uh, Lifetime, Lifetime Fitness, and built a, the editorial media division. Um, ended up hiring a team of all TV news journalists that were photojournalists, editors, and we began telling uh, brand films inside the organization. Everything from people transforming their themselves um, to our nonprofit that we did some of the uh, video for, documentary style. And then from there, um, some of those pieces had, had gotten some good attention from other corporations. And I started to realize, wow, it's a, it's a big world out there. So I think I'm going to go this on my own and started the company that I'm running now called Thomas and Edwards Group. The middle names of my two sons, the greatest stories of my life. And we now work with all kinds of different clients um, telling their stories from a completely, uh, the best that we can anyway, completely editorial approach, non-scripted, non-staged, very low uh, product placement or logo placement. And um, took my whole team with me and we now have a team of nine stationed across four different regions in the country and, and covering all kinds of stuff. And that's the story. It was probably more than 60 seconds. So Robin, I'm going to send it to you next because once again, we, we do lose you early. So please take it from here. Thank you so much, Heidi. You know, it's, it's great um, hearing your story and I look forward to hearing the uh, stories of the other panelists that we have. Um, and I can already tell that there are going to be similarities, right? I mean, um, I started, you know, with an interest in journalism as a, as a young kid as well. Um, I think part of this came from the house that I was in. My um, parents were, were big into reading the newspaper. My mother was an avid newspaper clipper, so she would clip <laughs> stories out of the newspaper and leave them, you know, for me and for inspiration, etc. And I think that was the first thing that kind of piqued my interest in journalism. Um, I just always loved to read and to write, so that was just always, you know, something that was ever present for me. And in high school, um, I joined the high school paper um, and carried that on with me to college. It was like the first thing I did when I hit campus was to join the campus newspaper. So uh, I spent a number of years there and just um, knew that I wanted a career as a writer, but I also was practical, right? I was like, what career can I have as a writer and you know, um, kind of earn a living? So um, journalism was the first thing that I turned to. Um, I went to J school at Northwestern uh, University. Um, so I spent a, a, a very intense year there, kind of, I love the program because you're able to really immerse yourself and really um, cover stories in Chicago and in the Chicago area, you know, as a beat reporter. And so I, I really enjoyed that experience. Um, and then from there, I'm like my first job um, was meant to be a reporter um, at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, and in those days, they were actually starting to talk about the end of journalism at that time as well. And so um, what happened was uh, the, the job that I had ended up um, not coming to fruition. And I found myself at um, US News and World Report magazine uh, through a contact. I uh, started out as a fact checker. Um, worked my way up into reporter, researcher, 
um, covered a lot of things like uh, consumer news um, and their news you can use section, um, did you know social issues. Um, and uh, the pivotal point for me there was stepping into the digital space. Um, they had started their website um, and I became like one of the early associate producers uh, for their uh, website um, and got an opportunity to um, understand what multimedia journalism was all about. Um, and I think that um, uh, afforded me the opportunity to then go over to Discovery. Someone that I worked with at US News um, went to Discovery Channel um, where they were standing up a, a massive um, digital division. Um, and from there, I was able to work as a producer um, on many digital um, shows on their digital platform. So this was basically um, coming up with stories to support the television shows um, and creating those websites to support those, um, those shows and telling stories, um, whether that's, you know, through live events or on social media or through newsletter or, you know, any of the platforms that we had available to us, uh, webcasting. Uh, was a big thing at the time as well. So um, I spent 12 years um, at Discovery um, in a variety of roles, working across a number of the digital sites and uh, ended up being a, a director of uh, TLC and AnimalPlanet.com. Um, and uh, during that time, uh, I was let go. Um, I was laid off and a passion of mine at the time was uh, travel and still is. Um, so I took some time to just travel um, the world and to see some places that I hadn't had an opportunity to visit and started a travel blog and did a lot of travel writing for Travel Channel. Um, and uh, through a series of events was able to uh, land a job at Marriott um, and uh, as a contractor. Um, at the time, they were looking to stand up this site, um, editorial site. Um, really focused on inspiring travel at the top of the funnel. They really wanted people to um, think about destinations um, and not really just talk about uh, this, this e-commerce, this booking conversation, but really start before people even got there um, by inspiring them to um, visit destinations and to do that like a local. Um, so I felt like it was the perfect marriage of, of passion um, with skill set um, for storytelling that that led me to to where I am today. And so I've been here for about five years now um, and we've been um, growing the site um, uh, exponentially. We started with about three destinations and now we cover about 80 destinations so far. Uh, we have about over 2,000 stories on the site uh, featuring, you know, all the things you can do in a destination, uh, food, drink, um, itineraries, etc. cetera. Um, that I think will, um, that have, have proven to um, really inspire Marriott Bonvoy members and, and travelers at large. Love it, Robin, thank you so much. I wish we were in one of those warm, toasty places right yes. about now, don't you? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Meg, I'm gonna go with you next. All right, I will um, also try and encapsulate a long journey into a short story, which is difficult. Um, I did not start out broadcasting to my stuffed animals, so Heidi has me on that one. <laughs> but um, I did, my first journey into journalism was, was during undergraduate. Um, I took a job at the local CBS affiliate, started as a, a desk producer and a live producer, and you know didn't know what the heck I was doing and couldn't believe anyone had put me in touch in, in charge of a rundown, <laughs> let alone a live program. But uh, worked my way through that for a couple of years, um, finished at school, and Moved back to Atlanta, which is where I grew up, and you know I grew up uh, an Atlanta girl that was that was very in tune with what was happening in the Turner and the CNN universe, um, and got a job at Turner straight out of university. Um, I started as a, a PA in the public affairs department, so doing all the feel-good documentary stories that focused on the Atlanta region. Um, and after a couple years of of moving up through that, I had an opportunity to join Turner Sports with a focus initially on NASCAR, so cars going fast and left, and um, moved from that on to primarily a focus of um, NBA on, on both TBS and TNT, and then when Turner acquired the rights to NBA TV and NBA Digital and launched the OTT and streaming platform, 
I was producing uh, everything from brand campaigns to feature stories and social first multi-episodics, um, and, and it really ran the gamut. Um, I was offered an opportunity after about 15 years at Turner to move to Red Bull Global, which I thought was really interesting, a position based over in Europe and Austria, that's where their headquarters is. And they, it was an opportunity to really step from a broadcasting perspective into the internal workings of a arguably the world's best branded content creators at the time. Um, you know, everyone knows Red Bull as the energy drink, but they're also a huge media company with a huge uh, machine that churns out everything from full length feature documentaries to live broadcasts. Um, I was the executive producer and director for what they called the flanking content division, which was the division that created all the supporting content in the arts, music, and culture space um, for their live broadcasts. So that could have run the gamut from a full-length documentary to a multi-episodic social first series to um, like traditional 30, 60, 90 promos campaigns. Um, and it was very interesting to be inside a brand that really did act no different than a broadcaster, which is where I started really thinking about this idea of brands ad broad, ad, as broadcasters and what does branded content mean and where are audiences going to find content that they are interested in and they want to engage with. And as the lines between digital and linear are changing, what that means and where people go to get the stories that they want to get. Um, everything from tactical information to entertainment and everything in between. Um, you know, so I spent a number of years doing that and eventually wanted to come back stateside and have started a business, um, Two Birds Films, as you mentioned, and we really cater both to the commercial side of things, the high-end you know, commercial and advertising traditional space, and as well as the, the branded content and entertainment space. So telling stories for brands, really understanding what it is that they need to get out into the universe, what audiences want to see, and how to bridge that gap in between those two places. Fantastic. And we're going to circle back on something that you said, because I want to hit on that here um, here quickly. Thank you, Meg, very much. Angela, take it away. We want to hear your story. Oh, hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. I love hearing about all of your journeys. And there certainly are similarities, I think, between all of us. Um, I'm going to try to be even faster than everybody else, which is <laughs> I moved to New York City in the 90s. I wanted to be Tina Brown. I ended up working in pop culture. I didn't become Tina Brown, but I worked at InStyle, Harper's Bazaar. Um, I had a kind of fun, glamorous life in my youth, um, covering entertainment and fashion. And then I worked my way up the ladder, starting as a fact checker, just like Robin, all good editors and journalists start as fact checkers. And then um, you know, eventually you're managing people and you're learning how to manage a brand, which I think is something that um, we do bring our journalistic muscles to these roles, but I think when you work at a major media company, you have a wonderful training ground on how to manage a brand because that's what you are. You're like stewards of these brands, like in style or, you know, I worked at People Magazine on their brand extensions. And so you really have to start to think about all the ways that brands touch and reach their people and their purpose. And those are the same sort of philosophies that you bring to another kind of company that's not a media company. Um, like other people, um, I saw the world around me changing a lot um, a couple of years ago when I was last at what was formerly Time Inc. Um, I was leading digital at InStyle and I was working a lot with our advertising team to come up with creative ideas to respond to RFPs from agencies and to think about how we work with our brand partners. And so when the sort of onion unraveled there, I was like, hmm, maybe I'll take some of my bright ideas and move over to the brand side, um, which I did. And I was originally focused on entertainment and fashion and I had some, a great little mini consulting business going before I discovered HP. Um, I love being in the tech space. It's something that I had never done before this role, but I think that bringing some of um, what I learned in my pop culture world and a natural curiosity to this brand really helps us to be able to translate what they're doing and um, create stories that we can push out to a bigger audience. 
And since I've been at the company about two and a half years now, um, we've launched a sort of storytelling hub. We work with some great partners to produce um, content articles. Um, we do a magazine, we do short films, um, like one that premiered at uh, Brand Storytelling called History of Memory. I hope some of you have seen it. And um, it's a wonderful ride and it's wonderful to be able to tell stories of meaning, to be able to hire talented people to help us tell these stories, which I think is a wonderful benefit of coming from the world of publishing to a brand to be able to sort of like pull in all of these people that you know are expert storytellers and put them to work telling this, these stories. Um, so it's a, it's a great journey and I'm thrilled to have this conversation with you guys. Thank you, Angela. Love that. You bring up a lot of really good points as well. Well, you all did. Um, as I hear you all talking though, and we, and we see and hear these similarities, um, I wonder, uh, Meg brought up a really good thought. You know, we hear brand journalism and we hear all of this different type of work that makes up this sort of enormous term of brand journalism. I think it really encompasses all different types of work. So maybe we should first quickly sort of define what that is. It really seems like it varies from one organization to the next, even from one industry to the next at times. So I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, how do we standardize some sort of measurement to, to show success? I mean, this is the age old, you know, we don't, it's not all about ROI. Maybe it's about um, engagement and connection to that audience, but it feels like maybe the step before that should be a little bit more about what exactly brand journalism is before we can standardize a measurement of some kind for success. Meg, I'm going to let you start with that. I know it's something that you've thought about. Yeah, um, I actually wrote some notes about this. So if my, uh, this is going to be a, a very director type of thing to say, if my eyeline moves away, it's just because I'm looking at my notes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think, um, I, I think you're right that there's, there's a bit of a problem of nomenclature in regards to branded content. You know, on the one hand, we can, we can, we can ask everyone in the chat how to define branded content, branded journalism, branded storytelling, and we could get a dozen different answers because I think the understanding of the concept is there, it's a new landscape that hasn't really been systemized yet. So there isn't an official definition for branded content, which means, or branded journalism, which means there's this great landscape or sandbox of opportunity to really play and tell some amazing stories and amazing spaces. But the thing that I find really interesting is that while it's a new landscape, it's not necessarily a new concept. If we think back kind of historically into this idea of storytelling and broadcast storytelling and brand storytelling, you know, where did soap operas come from? Where did I Love Lucy come from? You know, these were, these were things that were happening decades ago that were brought to audiences and sponsored by brands. They, weren't, they were just packaged in a way that's maybe a little bit different than we do right now. And, and I think with the line between digital and linear that I was referencing changing, Brands can really use an opportunity to be a broadcaster just like any other traditional linear network could have in the past. So I think it's a matter of, of brands really understanding that they can act as, as broadcasters. They can offer a wide variety of content to their audiences and that that content is different in different slices of the pie as it should be. There's tactical reasons to tell branded stories there's entertainment reasons, there's inspirational reasons. And, and sure. when we talk about branded content, I think we don't need to limit, to any, limit it to any one of those buckets. I think instead of, um, it's not an either or conversation, it's a yes and. So what can, we, what can we do in this space to really leverage that audiences will go to the places where they find relevant and personalized and interesting content to them and then how do we really reverse engineer as brand storytellers and brand journalists content that is meaningful and matters to them? And that's where I think the interesting space is right now to play in and where brands have such power to really play. No um, doubt. This is, this is Robin. Yeah, I wanted Robin. To, to hop in and just say that, you know, um, I think that it's um, a point of view. Um, at uh, Marriott, we call it editorial storytelling. Um, and I think it is um, how you're telling the story that is the difference here. Um, when we think about how a traditional marketer might tell a story, um, I think they're going to think about the brand first 
Whereas I think with um, the journalism approach, you're thinking about the audience first. You're thinking about how you're going to tell a story that's relevant to that reader. Um, what do they care about? Um, and, and telling that story honestly, um, uh, truthfully, um, based in fact, um, and um, thinking about that from an ethical standpoint as well. Um, what is it, you know, how can we bring that story to life authentically um, so that um, whoever we're telling that story to, wherever they are, whether that's in print or digitally or um, that, that that resonates with them and they take some truth from it. Um, and that is the thing that I think um, uh, helps them become closer to the brand um, because we've been able to provide you with information that's useful, that's informative, um, that's also inspired you um, from, a, from a point of truth. Um, I want to just echo a little bit of what Robin was saying. I think that um, that was one of the biggest lessons and the heaviest lifts to do when joining the brand was to say, um, think about the audience first. And the audience is not your um, internal people that you're trying to impress, which I think happens a lot um, inside big corporations. But this idea of serving somebody and what makes it, what makes this piece of content like worth someone's time? Um, are you, you know, time is very valuable. Are you informing them? Are you entertaining them? Um, but I also think that there is a difference between just brand storytelling and brand journalism. I think brand journalism is a very specific type of storytelling that has uh, the, the ethics of journalism. And Robin mm -hmm. touched on these. And so I think a lot of it is when we say truth, we mean that we fact check our stories and it's not full of hyperbole. We also always make a point of um, getting outside sources. If you're writing a story and the only people you're quoting in it are your, your executives and your brand people, it's not journalism then, it's <laughs> PR, you. it's marketing. So this is, this, so it's like, there is a place for those types of stories and there's a type for other types of content, just like there's a type, there's entertainment or there's the I Love Lucy show or um, there are other types of brand content. But brand journalism, I believe, is a specific type of storytelling that has its basis in uncovering a, the truth and a true story and providing information or inspiration about something you didn't know before. Yeah, uh, such a great point. And I, I really, really appreciate that, Angela. Um, I, I think it brings about so many other um, topics of discussion too, like where best should a journalist fit inside of organizations who are going out and, and really trying and seeking journalists to bring in for the, these editorial approaches and some of this for lack of a better word, truth telling, brand journalism. Should they sit in corporate communications? Should they sit in marketing? Should there be a separate vertical altogether? Does yeah. it even matter? Where do we get the best have... collaboration from, um, you know, to make it smooth and great and really easy? What you need to do is you need to sit under the executive who believes in the passion and believes in the purpose of you. So I think it's less important about like what you define it as marketing or communications, but to, that you have someone at the top of the chain who really understands and values storytelling. Robin, do you agree? Uh, um, you know, some of the experiences that myself and other friends and other journalists who have made this jump um, into corporate, again, for lack of a better word, um, you know, if you don't have that executive buy-in and mm -hmm. there's an organization that, that isn't used to this way of thinking, much more traditional in their marketing, uh, you know, what happens when there's the, the potential gap there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say that I think, um, I feel fortunate being at Merit because I feel like um, the, the, the organization understands uh, the value of this kind of storytelling. And, and we originated in the marketing uh, team because it, the idea came from you know, someone in the global marketing team. And as Angela said, it was this, this is the champion, this is the person that felt this was valuable and that's kind of how this originated. Um, and I think ever since, um, it has been um, baby steps, right? I think first you have to kind of show the value um, once they kind of see the value of this kind of storytelling, whether that comes through in newsletters or through 
um, how these stories are able to actually drive ROI, even though that's not your main intent, um, it, it, it's organic. It happens, you know, because people are, find these stories valuable to them and then that, that makes that connection. So um, I think that that's, that's the biggest part of it is just kind of taking it step by step, showing the value where you can, um, and, and if, if it can tie back to the business use, then that's the thing I think that makes everyone, you know, everyone's light bulb go off. Yeah, um, we need those light bulbs. And I yeah. know that it is 2.30 and it's it time is. for you to jump. In fact, <laughs> you is. mentioned the global team and I know you're getting on a call, another yeah. Zoom with Marriott Global. So I'm really happy for you to be going back to work. And we appreciate your time, Robin. Thank, thank you, you so, so very much, much for having me. Absolutely. Bye -bye, guys. Hey Meg, um, you know, we do, we do seem to tell all marketers that they're storytellers or that they should be storytellers or that they need to learn this. It seems like a lot of that is happening uh, these days within business. And then we really kind of hold up companies and we've kind of already said it a little bit here today. Uh, we hold up companies that are saying, yes, we, we are a media company. Um, but you know, is there kind of a divide still, or is it just confusing that they're not all journalists? Do they need to be? I mean, of course not, but I still think there's a lot to talk about with whether or not that matters. Should you have a team of journalists on board if you're going to be doing this type of work? I mean, you know, I've been, I've been really fortunate to be on both sides, on the broadcast side, in the brand side, and now, you know, as an external consultant that's servicing those needs. I think it's less about having somebody inside the organization that can tell the story, because there are great storytellers inside every organization, and there's great consultants external to every organization. It's more about having somebody at the top, you know, to, to Robin's point, Angela's point, that, that really is a champion for the idea of telling stories and understands that there's value in it coming from the brand perspective. I mean, there are brands that are very um, risk tolerant and they're very innovative and forward thinking and they may get this a little better. You know, I mentioned Red Bull as a model before. They're a model that really understands the value in the tactical messaging of how do we sell the can, how do we sell the drink, and then the fuzzier experiential piece of it, which is where the media company came from and why they produce as much content as they do, understanding that not every piece of content, you know, to your point about product placement earlier, not every piece of Red Bull content has a can in it. It's about telling a story about an athlete, a person, a place, a thing, an experience mm -hmm. that makes you feel like you're connected to the brand, that, it, that you as a person somehow are connecting to this ethos that makes sense to you, you can relate to. And while there's not necessarily a very simple way of saying, you know, drawing that straight line between they watch this piece of content, therefore there are can sales go up, you're creating this right. affinity for the brand experience, which then does result and a longer term retention, a longer term loyalty um, from your consumers and your audience. So I think it's, it's, you know, it's just a matter of, of really figuring out how to bridge that gap. I know Rick has talked about this before too, as of you and I, but that gap of, of you know, traditional marketers that may and bridging it over into the storytelling space where it's less mm -hmm. about, you know, hitting you over the head with buy my product at this price, do this thing, because yep. we know audiences are oversaturated with that. They're tired of it. They want to have stories that teach them something or inspire them to do something or make them feel connected. And, and that's where I think the power of brand journalism and storytelling really is. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And we, we noticed quite a bit of that too um, and tried to uh, wade through it a little bit at Lifetime. You know, there hadn't been a lot of video storytelling and I was primarily, um, you know, doing all of that with, with our teams. And so what did it mean when, when somebody loved a piece, you know, and like we mentioned earlier, inside the organization, the pieces were received really well and they were bringing about a lot of emotion. And we had this joke, you know, we're showing one of the, editorial pieces so now everybody's going to cry <laughs> it's like if you cry that's not the only emotion that we're trying to get out um, you know if you laugh that's feeling something too but when we started to see uh, what really started to matter was not necessarily that one five ten a hundred more people joined as members 
at Lifetime, but it was the engagement and the conversation that started to develop in the community of people who could start sharing their experiences, um, feel inspired by someone who, for example, had lost 100 pounds or maybe even only 30 pounds or you know many other stories that we told, but they started to see themselves in these characters that we were able to bring forward. And that was successful. Um, you know, when you talk about social consciousness and so forth, we actually have a, um, someone that is watching, Mark Patterson, thanks for your question, Mark. I'm gonna throw this out to you, Angela. He says, as brands are demonstrating more social consciousness in their advertising, are you seeing more collaboration between brands than emerging? What do you think on that? I'm not sure I understand the question. More collaboration between brands and emerging, emerging. He's asking about because brands are demonstrating so much more social consciousness, this idea of impact. Are we collaborating more story. within the within the brand? Right. Oh mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, there are we're living in a very unusual time. We haven't yet really discussed our present state of being in this call yet, but um, I think that one of the things that's happening quite acutely around our company is the need for um, of telling honest stories about purpose that are inspiring and helping people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, I'm lucky that we work at a, I work at a company that does good all the time, even when it's not like the focus of attention. Um, and one of my job purposes is to like find those stories and bring them to life so people can see the good work. But right now, um, more than ever, I think that there are so many things that um, people are looking for, for information, for inspiration, even like what your company is doing or the leaders within your company and the lessons that they're learning as managers or as executives is valuable and interesting information. That's a type of brand journalism too. Um, and so I do, I, we actually have a whole deck that we've put together um, combining marketing and communications, a real collaborative effort about the best way to put ourselves forward during this time. And um, I was really thrilled to see that brand journalism was a big part of that conversation. And um, you know, I think that marketers who maybe in the past were very focused on product sales are realizing that this is not the time to be focused right. on the traditional type of marketing. So in some ways it's allowing these other stories to rise up a bit higher. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. Um, I'd love more detail on that. You know, as you said, it, it feels like now is the time and we were going to try to be a little bit careful not to let COVID-19 or coronavirus kind of overshadow the entire event. So I appreciate you bringing it up because I do think it's a really unique time. It is more now than ever people are not wanting to be sold, I don't think. And um, though I've always believed that our audiences are, are far smarter and savvier than we sometimes give them credit for, they can sniff a commercial 100 miles away. But, um, you know, is this the time where, where maybe some brands who've been a, a little wary of, of this approach or this tactic, if you will, um, because now people are sort of focused more on their emotions maybe, or on, on maybe it's just a time thing. They have more time to watch longer content. Some of our stuff yeah. gets a little you know, bit it is, longer. It, I think it's hard. I feel, I think if you, you hadn't, if you didn't have the right things in your pipeline, I think now you have to just be really sensitive about what you're putting out into the world. And, you know, as a curator, as an editor, a publisher, a brand creator, they, you always have to think like this. But now more than ever, you know, before you push something out into the world, you really need to ask yourself, what is its value? And is this something, is this something appropriate and wanted now? And, you know, we had had a big, th a, you know, long lineup um, looking into March and April and beyond. A lot of it was around sustainability, around Earth Day. We have some amazing things that we're working on that we were bringing to life with stories. But, um, but we're like, oh, maybe we don't need to do this. Maybe, you know, pushing this out pegged to Earth Day isn't as important as it was before. We can tell that story another time because there are other things happening now that are more relevant. Um, and I think, I also think that having a journalist training is very effective at this time that we're living in because you have to, in some ways, think like a news person. So I think that ability to be able to pivot, to restructure something, to see something in a new light, 
um, and ask the right questions, which I think is what journalists are trained to do, is really valuable. And just to go back to your previous question, I do think it's important for brands to have journalists on, on the team, um, not a, because I think that it's a, you always want somebody who thinks differently on, as a part of your organization. And ultimately, that would be the role of a good journalist who joins a marketing or communications team would be to ask the questions and to approach storytelling from a way that perhaps a traditional marketer does not. Right, right. I think it's a good mix. Meg, what, what do you see out there when you, when you think about um, journalists working with marketers um, and sometimes alone, sometimes they're given the power, maybe this is something interesting to talk about too, not the power, the, they are um, allowed, if you will, to go and hire more journalists um, to begin having a bit more of a presence and to begin to be potentially more successful with this approach. I think, um, you know, they're, they're subject matter experts for a reason. There are people who tell stories in the PR space in a very targeted and specific way. There's people who tell stories in the advertising space in a very specific and targeted way. And then I think this, this emerging space requires um, almost, you know, it's almost a, I don't want to say it's a new position because journalists have already always existed, but I think it's, it's a new way of combining you know, storytelling in its traditional sense and production techniques and the way that we, you know, we are raised to tell stories with, with corporate initiative and authenticity and ethics. Um, mm. I, think, I think the point about being timely and understanding how to not be tone deaf as a brand, you know, to be able to be quick and relevant, and again, not to allow, you know, Corona to overtake the call, but understanding why you should modify your approach or why you should modify the stories that you're trying to tell understanding maybe how your audience is feeling, you know, I mean, I'm, I think about just myself as a case study or the people that I'm interacting with and we're so oversaturated right now with Corona content that we almost don't mm -hmm. want it. You know, there's, mm -hmm. and if a brand can say, Hey, we get you, we feel you and we're going to offer something that both, you know, fits your needs and fits ours. That would be awesome. Um, you know, I, I had the luxury of listening to an amazing interview with the former surgeon general of the U S um, Dr. Murthy the other day, and he's just written a book called together. Um, and it talks about this idea of how humans connect and what allows us to, to really weave the bonds as opposed to pulling them apart. And I think while this is a, you know, a, a tangential kind of idea, it, it comes back to this idea of empathy and understanding. And so if we're trying to connect to each other as humans from an empathic perspective, brands need to also understand that their audiences are humans that need to be connected yeah. to and spoken with in a way that you know, is often more two-way and more um, you know, I don't, I don't want to say fuzzy, but definitely an understanding of, of emotion and relevancy and timeliness and empathy that comes into the way that that story is told or what stories are told or how it's being told. Um, so I think, you know, journalists have a specific skill set that applies really nicely to that space and is very needed, I think, right now. Um, Again, I, I, it's yeah. whether they're in-house or out of house, that's a different, you know, I think, I think you need a good partner that understands how to tell that story in that right way. Um, no doubt about it. And I think, you know, now is another time, and we've all discussed this a little bit, super fascinating that um, there are actually some studies and reports out now that are showing that some people, I don't have the number in front of me, uh, but some people are really putting their trust much more in brands over what they're seeing in the media. And I think that's something that is um, really a defining moment. And, and, you know, it's probably evolving if it in fact is true. Um, but boy, that really opens up a door for a lot of different things, namely, you know, the responsibility or the onus that goes onto the brand at that point to make sure that, as you said earlier, Angela, they are really doing their work to make sure that the fact checking is going on, sort of all the journalism 101 stuff. And then what, what power or how empowering it is for a brand to realize, wow, um, hey, we're not only a media company now, because we kind of kind of did that. Now we're becoming the media. How do you feel about this um, potential change that we could even see more of? It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, I think we've been paying attention to these studies that have, we've 
um, I think we talked about the uh, trust barometer from Edelman as one right. thing that we were looking at. And, um, you know, we're always looking to see that, you know, being a brand, a trusted brand is a goal. It's something that we all work towards and we build our reputation and our sense of purpose. And that's very important, but you can sort of see in like the collective thinking, how things are shifting. And, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, I, I would say that, um, you know, media companies for the past couple of years, probably since the 2016 election have had a decline in trust. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think the, the where people and how people are getting their news has been shifting, you know, that it's been changing, that people have been getting their news from their friends and people they know and their social media streams. And we're just now beginning to see, and, and again, it, it's happening now during um, this crisis that we're in, we're seeing a slight uptick that the trust of information coming from brands is on the rise. And I think that's very interesting. I mean, one, one way that could be happening would also be not just from consumers, but employees. We've been noticing that um, when it comes to communicating to our 50,000 employees around the world, our brand is like their number one source of information. In some sure. ways, they're, because there's such an overload of stuff coming at us right now that in some ways, that's another valuable service that we are able to provide. It's like, what's really important? What do you really need to know about right now? And I think that that's coming through a bit, but you know, it's a slippery slope because brands, they, it would be really easy to uh, abuse that trust and to, and to forget some of, some of the, the purpose behind everything. So it, you have to be cautious. Yeah. I feel like, um, you know, that's something that you, you have to be very, very delicate with. Once you have worked so hard to establish that trust and that connection with your consumer base or your audience or whatever it is, then you, then you really have to treat it like a, like a precious little baby <laughs> and not let it go. Uh, yeah. You really got to be careful. Hey, I want to get a couple of other questions in. Um, we're, we've got about, what do we have? About 10 minutes left. So if um, the audience has any other questions, please feel free to make sure that you, I'm supposed, Rick told me to go like this um, to send in your questions in chat right down below there. Um, <laughs> in any event, I do have a good one here that was uh, really interesting. It says, um, this is from Farah, who's done some really interesting work with metrics and measurement um, in this space, which I think is fascinating. A couple of white papers that are, are must reads. Uh, it says, how can we support journalists and media organizations during COVID-19 through the work we do in brand journalism? Um, advertising re revenue, as we've all seen, seems to mm. be dropping dramatically, local news organizations um, in particular. So how do we give back to the industry that we are all um, still a part of? Meg, I'll start with you on that one. Mm, good question. I think... Um, you know, I think it, it, it almost piggybacks on what Angela was just saying in terms of understanding how, how brands really are becoming broadcasters in their own right, and they have this platform to disseminate information. Um, you know, when you couple that with the idea that audiences aren't channel loyal anymore, they search for the, you know, the, the, they search for the content they want to see, but they aren't necessarily loyal to the platform or the place that they find it. Um, I, think, I think brands have an interesting opportunity to, to be able to, to be additional and supplemental broadcasters, especially in times like this. And maybe that is a way to, to supplement journalists, um, you know, who are on the broadcast side of things, but from a brand perspective, you know, not shying away from, from stories that can, can make a difference and make an impact and standing for something as opposed to standing for nothing, you know, um, taking a, taking a stand where it matters. And again, knowing that you're going to be able to connect more deeply with your audience that way and, and really be more authentic. You know, I think it's, it's that responsibility that, that we keep talking about in this conversation that brands need to carry. There is a heavy responsibility to be authentic and true and correct as opposed to tone deaf and brand focused internal, um, to your point, Heidi, I think audiences are way too smart and they get it and they mm -hmm. see through it um, and they don't have a tolerance for it anymore. So, I mean, I ho hope that sort of touched on what Farah was getting at in terms of being supportive and understanding that it's another mm -hmm. channel that can be active in these times. Yeah, 
And um, in my experience at one of the companies that I worked with, um, we tried to do a little bit of that. We tried to really reach out to even the local news media and, um, and some of the nationals just from where I had spent time and where I still had relationships. We put together these pieces. And since I was working with all journalists, all my photographers, um, all of my editors, everybody, as I said earlier, all came from TV news. We knew very, very clearly um, and were the SMEs in, in what would actually be able to be lifted straight onto air, uh, free of charge to them, free of having to send out a crew to go and cover something that would be of interest to them that we were doing at our company. Um, and we, we were able to say, hey, here's a fully editorial piece for you. Um, we can shorten it if you need to. You, know, we can, you can put your graphics on it. We were kind of giving some... Um, pre-produced packaged material to them and that um, had worked out a couple of different times in a couple of different markets for us it's, so that is a win-win I mean, yeah the, the tv shows get to the news shows get to fill their show which believe it or not sometimes is hard and then the company gets this editorial piece that is much more of a feel good than a commercial um, I, just to echo that a little bit, and hello, Farah, it's nice to see your name pop up. <laughs> um, I, uh, I agree with everything, but I also um, just wanted to offer some practicality things, which is we're actually looking at um, licensing some content from some publications right now. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it's similar to what you were talking about, where this idea of bringing in an edited or a curated piece from a news organization and publishing it and broadcasting it. Um, again, because we're working in journalism and we're telling our brand stories, but we're, we're very conscious of the types of things that people want and the, and the need to be quick. So we're looking at media companies and we're, talking, we're, we're thinking about setting up a contract or two where we would license some content from some very big established newspapers that would be, we would publish them for our audience on our branded content site. And so it'll be interesting, it's an interesting relationship to explore because we're thinking about pulling in stories that aren't about our brand, but they're, but we think that they fit in with the other things that we're talking about. And, you know, we're not going to necessarily put paid media behind these stories that we didn't create or aren't about our brand specifically. But when you think about the mix and an engagement within our site and the benefit that we're giving to all of the people who follow us and are the employees, like they get that extra curation of think pieces provided to them will be really great. Yeah. And hey, you know what? I want to give a little shout out to you and your team. Um, I know that you have an, a, a film that's up for award at this little thing called, I don't know, what is it? Tribeca? I'm not quite sure um, what that is. Uh <laughs> So yeah, congrats we, you on that. Tell us a little you. bit about it, Angela. Oh, thank you for the plug. Yes, we this film that we debuted last year at Tribeca, um, History of Memory, just got nominated for a Webby Award. I'm so excited. Hi, Sam. I know we That's were at terrific. Tribeca last year, but we'll be there again next year I, with something new. But if you so have- So wait, time, Angela, yes. I don't want to interrupt except to say that Sam is saying it won. So I want to make sure it, it yes, actually won, won that you said, okay, did. okay, got it. That was, but that was last year. Now we're up for another award. I thought that was breaking news. <laughs> we did. <laughs> we did win at Tribeca, uh, their brand uh, award. Sam, you can help me. What's the official? It was brand X. How much? It's like up here on my, my shelf up there. I could probably go get it down. <laughs> but cool. yes, anyway, the That's Tribeca great. X award, which, um, you know, if you're making a great piece of content, you should definitely connect with Tribeca and make sure you get that platform out. But meanwhile, go to the Webby Awards and find us. There's a brand storytelling content. And our story, our little short films, which are about people and photography, is up against uh, some big players, including Lucas Films and a bunch of Star Wars. Wow. So I wow. don't understand how that's like branded content necessarily. But, but. Is the film again? Is this one, is this the wake up? No, this is called the hit that the, the this is called History of Memory. Okay, that was the Wake other was, one. Yeah, but Wake Up will probably it. have its award day next year. <laughs> wow, so many awards, so hard to choose from. Thank you for the Absolutely, plug. absolutely. Well, I don't want to go over our time here. How are we doing on time, Rick and Drew? No, I'm so used to having the news IFB in my ear to get production cues, but we don't really do that right now. So I hope that we're staying on time. You're um, good, use as much time as you like. We're we good. Five, I've just we heard from the producer. We could take, we could take one more question. 
Um, we can probably take one more question is what I am hearing. And I have one here. I think it is from a gentleman by the name of, pardon me one second, guys, by the name of Chris. And um, he just basically says it's a, it's a kind of a, uh, a general question, which is just great. It says, I started doing brand journalism videos in something like 2008. The buy-in at the time, not very well received, but um, it seems like brands are now getting it, what, which we've seen, of course. But what do you think the turn in the tide is or was or will continue to be? Go for it, Meg. <laughs> Um, I think it comes down to a lot. I mean, look, I work with a ton of brands now that get it and a ton that need to be converted. And I pitch to a ton of brands that just, they, they're not quite there yet and understanding the value of the spend. And a lot of the conversation we have is, okay, look at the bigger picture about where this content can go. Who's going to see it? How are you going to have influence with it? Can you recoup your costs? Can it be monetized? Can you distribute this to an external streaming platform? and get your costs covered. Um, but it, it takes the right brand to really understand how that works. You know, we see brands like Patagonia with fish people and Johnson and Johnson. Um, the name of the film is escaping me right now, but Ward B. Uh, thank you. That one, <laughs> um, you know, the Royal Caribbean was behind an entire feature film with Kelsey Grammer and Kristen Bell on Netflix as, you know, arguably long format branded content where they get, the investment recouped and they get access to an audience that's far beyond what they could have on their owned and operated channels. But it's, think, it's really being able to think strategically about how it adds value to the brand in a universe, to Heidi's point, where there isn't, and Angela mentioned this too, as did Robin, but um, there is no one official metric that says branded content works and here's why. So I think when you have a brand that's very used to saying, okay, we're used to judging our spend and our investment based on these three metrics, you know, as the branded content creator at the table, you know, oftentimes I'm doing a little bit of a dance. Okay. But can you see the possibility? And if we tin cup with these three other departments, Absolutely. you guys can all, um, you know, have value in this and the reach will be so much greater and the influence will be so much greater. But I think it's a journey. I don't think, I don't think the tipping point has happened between the brands that understand it and get it and brands that don't. It's, um, that is a moving target right now. We got to get them talking, don't we? Um, I'm going to let you go ahead and sum it up real quickly, Angela, and then I'm going to toss it back to Rick. Your final thought on that. When's it all going to happen? Oh, I'd, I think it's happening right now. I think, um, I think that it's up to us to be creative and to try different ways of measurement. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot of sentiment work with a company called Notch, um, which comes to brand storytelling. I think when you think about entertainment, um, there's a whole nother phrase, a whole nother world of um, ROI and deliverables and maybe even some revenue to be made, which would really blow people's minds if we could start right. some additional revenue um, from our stories. So I think, it, I think that, the, that it's a very exciting, but you know, the budgets are going to get tighter in the next year. Mm -hmm. and so we're going to have to be really creative and, um, and really show the meaning of all this work. So thank uh, you. And I feel like yeah, and it's like a one man band that help really helps us. Not one man. You have a great team, but yeah, uh, yeah. but really helps us, uh, you know, articulate and and all the work that brand storytelling does really helps bring this to life that we can then take back to our companies, which I think really helps a lot too. Yeah, the big C collaboration, right? Collaboration and creativity. Ladies, thank you so very much for uh, having the discussion with me. Meg and Angela, and of course, Robin, who had to take off um, for her call with Marriott International. Rick, I'm going to toss it back to you. Thanks again for getting us all together. Oh, it's my pleasure. It was so great to have all of you here. I'm sorry Robin had to leave early. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the milestones, I think, that we've seen in the whole world of brand storytelling was the emergence of Marriott. Um, when David Beebe first went to Marriott mm -hmm. and said, you know, we're going to become the biggest provider of travel-related information on the planet, everyone went, wow, <laughs> that's that's a that's a big task, and you know they've done an amazing job. They've built an amazing team, um, and I'm glad that they're all going back to work. I think Marriott was really one of the, the leaders six, seven, eight years ago when that all started, and then of, of course Red Bull. Let's say another thing about just uh, measurement here is that you know the whole television industry kind of agreed that 
we're gonna we're gonna base all this investment on this thing called the Nielsen ratings, you know. And everyone knew Crazy. how flawed they were. <laughs> the, you know, I mean, some stupid little meter on on people's television sets that gets turned on once in a while. And then everyone, everyone agreed that's what we'll base billions of dollars of investment on that research. And when when brand storytelling industry comes up with the Nielsen ratings, um, mm -hmm. you know the the floodgates will open up. Um, right. So that's one thing. The other thing is that I think to underscore the the sentiment about it's this is not a time to be selling. This is a time to be compassionate and inspirational and and even entertaining. Um, and those aren't commercials. Those are stories. And and that's content. And you, you know, I just had this conversation with a friend of mine yesterday that ran a big agency for 30 years and thinking about what the future of the agency world is. And I got to really believe that it's more about the content world. Um, you know, people don't want to tune into commercials. They don't have to. You know, I think there's a big opportunity for people to kind of make a pivot from those who worked agency creative side to become back into the journalism side. So there, we may have some crossover. You all came from journalism into brand storytelling. There may be some marketing, advertising sorts that are gonna to wanna to come into the content world. It's an interesting place to be. I thank all of you so much uh, for your time today. I hope the audience enjoyed this. We're here for you. Um, anything you wanna know? See my email <laughs> Just email me your ideas for future shows and we will produce them. <laughs> Heidi, thanks so much. Meg, Angela, we'll see you around. Be Have safe. Good thanks, everybody. Wednesday. Bye, everybody.